everybody. I'm David. Happy Memorial Day weekend. I'm Mom and Dad, and welcome to Westby. VBS is the greatest single opportunity to minister to kids in our church and reach kids in our community and engage in gospel conversations. There are so many ways to get involved. Don't miss out on the fun and kingdom opportunities. Sign up today at vbs.westby.org. Join us Wednesday, May 29th at 6.15 p.m. in the playground field as we kick off summer with a blast. We'll have water inflatables, hot dogs, and hamburgers, games, and more. This is going to be a great night for the whole family. For more info about everything we have going on this summer, go to summer.westby.org. Summer suppers start June 5th. Join us for some great food and a lot of fun Wednesday evenings at 6.15 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. See what's cooking at menu.westby.org. Oh yeah, cost is just $5 per adult with a $20 max for a family. That's right, inflation, what inflation? Kids, fifth grade and under, eat free. Well, that's it for now. Let's worship together.
As soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. That evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, That isn't necessary. You feed them. But we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here, he said. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven, and blessed them. Then, breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples, who distributed it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterward, the disciples picked up twelve baskets of leftovers. About five thousand men were fed that day, in addition to all the women and children. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from the land, for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, It's a ghost! But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you, walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When he climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. After they had crossed the lake, they landed at Gennesaret. When the people recognized Jesus, the news of his arrival spread quickly throughout the whole area. And soon people were bringing all their sick to be healed. They begged him to let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe, and all who touched him were healed. Coach Lou, Lou Holtz. He is the one who gave my college commencement address. Now, you may say, well, what did he say? I have no idea what he said. Uh, but I remember it was very inspiring. Um, you know, graduation speeches, they'll tell you, you can, you can be someone now. You can rise to the occasion. And, and I thought those things. You know, I, I, here I am. I'm graduating college. Goodness, this was many years ago, 22 years ago now. And I moved to Indianapolis. I was really excited to to start a corporate career. And, and I, you know, the whole time, you know, 22 years old, working downtown, living downtown, you know, I thought I'd made it. And I guess some ways I had. I mean, I even got a signing bonus. I, I thought very highly of myself. I left college with my head high and my chest out because Coach Lou said I could do it, and I went and I did it. And then I had that first day on the job. Got my name badge, got my swipe card, and I got a cubicle on the 30th floor. Interior cubicle, no window. 
and I had a stack of financial statements, and my job was to sit there and crunch numbers all day long. Now, I don't know if that's making it or not, but I certainly was an obscure cog in a giant corporate machine. But it was a good job. I enjoyed the job, and I joke a little bit about it, but for a young guy with zero experience, it's a really good opportunity. In Matthew 14, Jesus feeds a, just a massive crowd of people with five loaves of bread and two fish. In fact, it says there in verse 14, he had compassion. He had compassion for the ordinary people. But where did Jesus get the loaves and fish? John 6 tells us that it was some kid's lunch. Some kid's lunch. You know, we should make much of the miracle, and we should highlight Jesus' compassion. But let's not miss the fact that there was this ordinary kid who had a lunch, and he was willing to give it up. You know, here in, here in this scene, there's about 15,000 people. It says 5,000, but that's men only. So there's probably about 15,000 total. And, and there's a, one layer to this story, the first layer, where Jesus just cares that there's this many people that are hungry. But I want to dig a little deeper. Because John 6, 14 says, when the people saw him do this mir miraculous sign, they explained, surely he is the prophet, the one we have been expecting. This miracle got the attention of 15,000 people. You know, imagine today if a, um, if there was a document. Now, today would be a YouTube video, but imagine today if there was a document that was circulating or a YouTube video saying 15,000 people witnessed a miracle 40 years ago. You could easily confirm it. Like, so 40 years removed is when this gospel gets written. You say, well, this miracle that 15,000 people witnessed happened 40 years ago. Well, easily you could confirm it. You go back and talk to the people that were there. All four Gospels record this miracle about 40 years after it happened. The Gospels would have been immediately dismissed or discredited if it was untrue. People would have written counter documents claiming that, you know, other versions of the story. There is no way these public gospel accounts would have any credibility in the first century if this story was a myth. It's true. It's not a question of if it happened, but why. The real story isn't that Jesus fed 15,000 people. I mean, he's God. We can do that. The real story is that nobody refutes it. It really did happen. And this miracle demonstrates how God uses the insufficient and produces an abundance. God's power is not only sufficient, but also abundant. Now, God's power is for us, but to realize it, we've got to recognize our own powerlessness. We're like the kid with the small lunch, faced with the impossible task of feeding 15,000 people. You can't do it. Like, that kid couldn't do it, but God can. You know, like that guy sitting in a cubicle, 30 floors up. You know, what, what can he do? What can that 22-year-old young man do? Well, do his job. But perhaps God is working through him. He worked through me. Even though I didn't, I'm nobody. And he'll work through you. Jesus could have displayed his power in an extravagant way. I mean, he could have just taken dirt and created gold out of it and said, here's gold bars for everyone. He could have sent lightning bolts to zap his enemies. The Pharisees start grumbling and just bam, they're just, you know, killed. He could have forced every creature that crossed his path to, to bow each time he was there. Why didn't Jesus bring attention to himself in this way? Well, there's a reason. Look at the ones who benefited from his power. It wasn't Jesus. It was the poor. It was the hungry. It was the demon-possessed. It was the sick. 15,000 people experienced a miracle because a kid was willing to give up his lunch. 
at our church this weekend, we're celebrating graduation Sunday. And I want to speak to the graduates. Uh, maybe you're watching this and you have someone of age or you are someone of age. You're, you're graduating. Maybe it's high school. Maybe it's college. Let's talk to the younger generation. You know, you can change the world for the better. I believe that. I, I know you want that. But how? You know, my generation, and I'm just going to be real with you. My generation, millennials, and your generation, we call you Gen Z right now, but we'll see where that ends up. I don't know if you like that or not, but that's the label. You know, we're the first, the millennials and, millennials and Gen Z, the first in American history to have it worse than our parents. And I'll just, I'll just be real with you. You are inheriting a fragile economy with a federal debt load of over $34 trillion. That's $100,000 per person in the United States. We're in a hole so deep, only God can get us out of this. Now, for, for those of you who are young and watching this, you did not create this problem, but you will be tasked with solving it. And frankly, for the United States to be saved, Christ will have to return before our debts come due because I don't know what's going to happen when they, when they finally come due. Unless, unless your generation can have a posture like this kid in this story with five loaves and two fish, and maybe we just have a few less rich young rulers. So we're going to measure success by sacrifice not by what we accumulate. And that's what I tell all of you, not anybody of any generation, because I know many of you who are older made great sacrifices for our nation. So we measure success by your sacrifice, not by what you accumulate. And we should be courageous. Let's look at this part of the text where Peter walks on water. This is fascinating to me. That, that phrase, walk on water, it's a, it's a common phrase. This is where it comes from. It, it means an impossible task. It means an extraordinary feat. I mean, it's something supernatural. And it goes back to the moment when Jesus literally strolls out to the boat on the water. Now, wh where is Jesus at this moment here um, in Matthew chapter 14? He's at the height of his ministry. I mean, after two years, his popularity is soaring. Thousands were, were fed with five loaves and two fish. I mean, the people were like, he can make food. He can literally make food. The people could literally taste his, his miracle. They taste the miracle. How powerful is that? And what does Jesus do at the height of his popularity? In verse 22, he tells the disciples to get into the boat, go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Then Jesus dismisses the crowd. And you can imagine the, 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 the disillusionment of the disciples. I mean, you were like, two years of building your popularity, two years of building your image, two years of building your platform and your following, and, and you're just telling people to go away? I mean, Jesus would have been an, a huge influencer of his day. And now he sends everyone back home. What's he doing? Why does he do this? Well, at this point, the people were simply interested in what Jesus could do for them. They were not interested in Jesus himself. The miracle of salvation is Christ himself, not what he can provide. And far too many people approach God with the attitude of, hey, what can you give me? The miracle of salvation means we get God himself, and that's the best thing of all. Now, as we're talking about this scene in the boat where Jesus walks on water, some of the disciples here, I mean, they're a lot, the, the, a, a chunk of the disciples are experienced fishermen. They know boats, they know storms. This is nothing that they have not seen. And here they are, they're battling the storm as they're fighting doubts about who Jesus really was. You know, they say, okay, we, Jesus, we had our moment to really capture this audience, and now everyone goes home, and we're out here on the sea. I mean, that, you know, he had his chance to be king. That's probably what they're thinking. He had his chance to be their king, and now he's squandering it. And I also want you to note about this story. Um, this story is less about the disciples' distress and more about Jesus coming to them. Um, you know, there's nothing in the text that says they were afraid of the storm. So, you know, sometimes we think, oh, this is a massive storm. They must have been fearful and you know, there's just nothing in the text to, to you know, to demonstrate that. I mean, storms are common on the Sea of Galilee. There's a meteorolo meteorological effect with these storms. 
Um, so the Sea of Galilee is like 600, 700 feet below sea level, surrounded by hills that tower about 2,000 feet above sea level. So what happens is the cool air pushes down, collides with the warm air over the water, churns up the sea. This happens all the time. Still happens today. So the disciples are not afraid until – they're used to this. They're not afraid until Jesus arrives walking on the water. You know, they were not expecting Jesus to just stroll out there. You know, John's gospel records that this was their only boat. So this is a big deal for them. Why are they terrified? Well, verse 26, they thought Jesus was a ghost. Here's Jesus strolling out of the water, walking effortlessly, and it spooks the disciples. Take courage, Jesus says. Why? Literally, if you get the literal terms, I, the I am is here. It's not just I am here. The I am. God is here. Take courage. The I am is here. True courage is derived from the presence of God. Now, Mark records this, Mark 6, 45. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across to the lake of Bethsaida, where while he sent the people home. So that's how this all this begins. So what that says there is Jesus knew what he was doing when he was feeding the thousands. Jesus knows what he's doing by, by telling them to get into the boat. This is all intentional. Mark's gospel also talks about how it's roughly like 3 a.m. You know, Matthew talks about how they're fighting heavy waves. I mean, they're exhausted. It's middle of the night, heavy waves. They've been rowing for like that's what they had to do. They didn't have motors back then, so they're rowing three to four miles in this storm, and, and they're just tired. And so Jesus strolls out there. They don't recognize him. And what this tells us is that your faith doesn't grow when life is easy. Your faith grows when you experience a trial. Your faith grows when you're tested and when a storm hits. Jesus saves you in the storm, certainly, that's a wonderful lesson here. If you're in a storm, Jesus will save you. But Jesus will also come on the storm. Sometimes the storm is there for a reason. Jesus will save you, but the storm reveals that we need saving. The trial, talk about you know God testing and pushing us. The trial can be the way God accomplishes his purpose. If you want to know the strength of something, what do you have to do? You have to test it. If you want to know the strength of your faith, it has to be tested. And just when you think there's no way that God can save you, no way that he'll show up, what does he do? He walks on water to get you. Jesus would have been tired as well. I mean, he's fully God but fully human. He prayed all night. And, And if you think about this, you know, Is his timing off here? I mean, the disciples think so. But what we learn is that God is never late. God's never even a couple of minutes late. What the storm does for the disciples is it it gives them a, a greater capacity to love and trust God. And that's what a storm will do for you. It will increase your capacity to love God more. But I love this. Peter shows courage. We make a lot about him sinking and I can understand that. But he gets out of the boat. So he sees Jesus. He gets out of the boat. Now, is Peter being impetuous? Is he crazy? Is he nuts? Is it just him being so tired? No. Verse 29 tells us that Jesus invites him out. And Jesus never invites us to do anything sinful or wrong. So Peter, by walking on water, was doing the will of God. Peter was doing what Jesus had asked him to do. And what is driving Peter here is so simple. He loves Jesus, he trusts Jesus, and he wants to be with Jesus in the storm. That's what it means to walk on water, to love Jesus, to trust Jesus, and to want to be with him in the storm. Peter knew boats. He was a fisherman. He knew storms. But this was the first time out of a boat and in a storm. He'd been in a boat and in a storm. This is the first time out of a boat and in a storm. You know, you can't build a person by repeating the same trial over and over again. You build a person by stretching them to do things they've never done before. Peter never done this before. Wildly stretched him. And if a little faith, it's it's a little, you have little faith. (laughs) The little faith here. Look at verse 31. You have so little faith. 
if little faith will get you walking on water, then I think we all know that we have more room to grow. Now, the test, the test was harder than Peter anticipated, and he started sinking in fear. But Jesus was right there to save him. And what is the result of all this? The result is found in verse 33. It's key. They worship. The result is when they come out of the storm, while they're in the storm, the point was to look more to God, to worship God for who he is. They recognized Jesus as God. And this is the first time the disciples claimed that Jesus was God's son. Some of you need some courage. (laughs) Some of you need to get out of the boat and take a step of faith. And you may say, but the storm is raging. Sure. Maybe it's because God wants to prove to you that Jesus has the power to save you. Whether you're a graduate, young person, looking for that next season, kind of the way I was, sitting in that cubicle on the 30th floor, thinking about Coach Lou, Coach Lou telling me I can do it. Whether you're an older and you're reflecting a lot in your life, or whether you're middle-aged like me, and you're experiencing a trial, and you've got a lot going on around you, Jesus is there. He's in the storm. He's on the storm. And he is there to save you.